welcome to another edition of From the Vault. On today's episode, I'll be exploring Dragon Magazine issue number 95. Now, um, a couple episodes back, I made a mistake. I was talking about issue 80, and I said that that was the first subscription birthday present that I got, and that was not correct. Issue number 94 was the beginning of my parents' uh, Christmas present, birthday present, Christmas present, because I'm in December. Um, so issue number 94 was the beginning of my subscription. Issue 80 was the first Dragon Magazine I ever got, just off the rack, but it wasn't part of the subscription. So just to clarify things, as I was going back to uh, kind of get my memories straight on that. So this issue, issue number 95, would have been um, the second in my birthday slash Christmas subscription. Um, now the interesting thing is, is that this illustration, this cover art, uh, which was done by Dean Morrissey in 1984, um, this cover art, interestingly enough, has kind of a, a modern vibe to it. So it's, it's got elements of fantasy. It's a guy at Toad and Cloak's Armorsmith um, and there's a sign on the table that says trade in um, old brass for new armor. And the guy's got like a trumpet right there. Uh, but he's clearly like a, a, a man of the late 70s, early 80s vibe um, in a kind of modern setting, but with this juxtaposition of an armor smith shop which I find interesting because D&D really didn't embrace that mix of fantasy and modern uh, back in this era. You know, whereas now I think there's more, um, I don't know, I think there's more of a, of a presence of people who are okay with mixing genres and stuff like that. So um, this was published, this episode, or this issue, not episode, this issue was published in March of 1985. Uh, right in the front cover is an ad for a little game called Talisman. Now, those who don't know Talisman and the original Talisman, this was a really fun tabletop board game that combined a lot of the adventure elements of D&D, but in a simple uh, board game format. So there were basically these different layers. You'd start on the outer layer and adventure until you can make it to the next level in the middle, and then you'd adventure until you get to the inner circle, and then the ultimate goal was to, you know, who could get to the crown of command first and then hold it. So there was kind of this adventuring thing, and there were a bunch of different um, classes that you could play. You could play a wizard, a troll, a warrior, ghoul, and then they had expansions, um, it was a game that you could play over and over and over again. And even if you played it a hundred times and you thought that you'd like hacked all the different ways to play it, um, it was still fun to play. And I know that there's a new version out. I haven't played it, but Talisman just has so many, it was so many good times, so many good times. All right, let's take a look through this issue, uh, the table of comment, contents here. So we have uh, Demi Humans Get a Lift. That's an article from Gary Gygax. The influence of Tolkien on the D&D and AD&D &D games by Gary Gygax. How Taxes Take Their Toll by Arthur Collins. The Ecology of the Cockatrice by Ed Greenwood. Prices for the Roaring Twenties uh, by Glenn Rahman. The subtitle for that article is Helping Modern Adventurers Sketch Their Dollar, Stretch Their Dollars. Uh, credit Where Credit Is Due. Um, by Catherine Kerr, a nonviolent examination of experience points awards, the many shapes of apes, battles above the dungeon, and desperate acts. So we'll we'll take a glance at all those things. But people, I got to tell you something, and I've said this before and from the vault. My 12, 13 year old self probably would have tuned out half of these articles because they were a little more mature. But you know, looking back at this now. I'm fascinated with each one of these articles. Like, it's really interesting to read this stuff uh, because they explore a lot of 
like higher level kind of adult topics and themes. And I don't mean adult by like inappropriate. I just mean like cognitively where you're at. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is I'm, as I'm looking back on these issues and kind of going through the vault is to see that although games have changed and although the industry has changed, there's an overall, there, there's, there are some universal threads. There are some, some kind of recurring themes that people continuously keep exploring in, in not just Dungeons and Dragons, but in other game systems and ideas that they explore. And I, I, I begin to think that these universal things that are, are found throughout decades are things that we explore because role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games, give us an opportunity to explore these things uh, in a way that, that we cannot maybe do so or cannot easily do in reality. So I think it, it's fascinating to hear uh, these ideas recurringly um, and, and to see them explored in these articles. So without further ado, let's get through it. So here we have the letters to the editor. Um, I'm going to skip because so many of them are nitpicky, crunchy, dumb things. Uh, let's see. So here is an ad, actually, for Dungeons & Dragons Fantasy Role-Playing Game Set 3, Companion Rules, The Creation of Kingdoms. So we're at a point with D&D history here in 1984-85 where um, higher level stuff is happening and you have to challenge your players with more than just dungeon crawls. Um, okay, so here we are, more forum stuff. Okay, so first full article, this is uh, Gygax. The last word on level limits and abilities. So level limits were a thing that... My understanding of level limits in, in first edition was basically a means of mechanically balancing things, right? So if, you know, if, if elves lived longer um, or certain races had certain abilities that humans didn't have, there needed to be a balance, right? So what gave humans an edge in older editions of D&D is that they could be anything. Humans could be like any class without limits. And the, the penalty, I guess, for choosing a demi-human, uh, a non-human player character race, was that they had to achieve balance. And in the early editions, their version of balance was this concept of, of uh, one version of that balance was level, level limits and abilities, as well as class restrictions. Um, this is a system that I was never comfortable with. It never made rational sense to me. Why, like, why wouldn't an elf be able to be anything that a human could be? And why would an elf not be able to, you know, get to the same level in a class as a human? Like, it, it just didn't make a lot of sense. But I want to touch on this so that um, you know people who maybe only have experience with more recent editions of D&D could have some insights into how the creators thought. Um, you know, because evolution, understanding the game and how it evolved gives you insights into where it's at now and why it is what it is now. So let's take a look. After long contemplation of the plight of dead-ended demi-human characters and considerable badgering from players with the same, it seemed a good plan to work up some new maximum levels for those demi-humans with super normal statistics. And in a couple of cases, just reward those with high stats across the board. Demi-humans were limited in the first place in the original rules because I conceived of a basically human-dominated world. So that's Gygax talking about why um, the demi-humans were limited. Now, if he conceived of a human-dominated world where options were more open for humans, I get it, in a sense. I, I understand that. Um, because narratively, it might make sense. But I don't think that that was the only cause. I don't think that's the only reason why these existed. Like I said previously, I think this was more about trying to mechanically balance things. 
Uh, let's continue. Considering their other abilities, if most Emma humans were put on a par with humans in terms of levels they could attain, then there isn't much question who would be saying sir to whom. With that in mind, let's move along to the matter at hand. Single class demi humans. If any player character demi human operates within a single profession or class, then that character can exceed all stated experience level maximums by two. For example, a player character dwarf with less than 17 strength who is a fighter and only a fighter can attain ninth level in that profession instead of being forced and only a cleric. Well, sorry to stop at 7th level. A half-elf who is a cleric and only a cleric can now rise as high as 7th level in that profession. Double-classed or triple-classed demi-humans must still abide by the level limits given in the player's handbook for each of their classes, such as the price of diversity. Such as the price of diversity. So there, now he's talking about multi-classing. And it makes sense that organically and narratively that multi-classing, you would stretch your... Blah -hoo! Abilities. This Dragon Magazine is so dusty that it's triggered my allergies. Just kidding. Um, so on the bottom of the sheet is a table that demonstrates how your stats can, and your single class or multi class abilities can, can affect your level limits. Um, So this article does two things, in my opinion. Number one, it demonstrates that the game had to evolve based on the player's feedback. Based on feedback, okay? And this is in an era before email, before internet, before easy surveys. So how is TSR getting feedback? They're getting feedback from people writing in letters. They're getting feedback probably at conventions and play tests. Um, People were giving feedback to the company and basically saying like, hey, this level limit thing, you know, isn't working for whatever reason. Um, and then the response is, okay, we'll, we'll raise levels. What does that mean in terms of the modern era? Well, you know, for one, fifth edition max out uh, Max is out at level 20. doesn't matter what, you know, if you're single-classed, you could be up to level 20. If you're multi-classed, whatever, how many classes you choose, bottom line, it still maxes out at level 20. So they achieve balance not through level limits. Um, and also in 5th edition, your race uh, doesn't get, like, you know, your choice for race isn't penalized. In other words, in older editions, if you made a half-orc, you might get a bonus to strength and constitution, but you'd get a huge negative on charisma. There's no such thing in 5th edition anymore. They don't do that. They balance things out differently. So as somebody who lived through this and played through it, I think the more modern solutions make more sense. Rather than penalizing, you, you just adjust and you buff in different ways. Um, some of you might disagree with me, and I welcome your comments. Um, okay, so that kind of goes through this, uh, this bit of that sort of racial stuff. Um, here's an interesting blip in this same thing from Gygax in the good news department. It's time to be rid of a pain in the neck, as I'm sure... All of you worthy enthusiasts will agree. The new material published within these pages, character classes, information on demi humans, spells, and so on, should be contained in one handy volume. And that is precisely what will happen this summer when a new hardbound AD&D game rule volume entitled Unearthed Arcana will appear in the stores. What happened was this. I got so tired of trying to keep track of photocopies, notes, magazines, and whatnot that I suggested to the kindly planners at TSR that perhaps an interim volume to expand the Dungeon Master's Guide and Player's Handbook would be appreciated by everyone who has suffered the same problems. Seeing as how the work on the full-scale expansion and revision of the system won't even begin for at least another year, everyone agreed. Material to be contained in the new book includes updated and revised versions of virtually all the articles written by yours truly and published in Dragon Magazine over the last three years. The Cavalier, Barbarian, and Thief Acrobat, 
the expansions and revisions of the Druid and Ranger classes, new weapons, new spells. So basically, um, that was the sneak peek at what would become Unearthed Arcana, which, you know, was, was kind of the big update, rules update, in a sense, for first edition AD&D before they got into the meat and potatoes with second edition. So um, evolution, my friends, is part of every game system, and this demonstrates exactly that. Um, going through, moving along. The influence of J.R.R. Tolkien on the D&D and AD&D games. Why Middle Earth is not part of the game world. This should be interesting. Um, <clears throat> a frequently asked question or assertion, in the case of those who don't bother to ask, deals with the amount of influence of J.R.R. Tolkien on the creation of D&D. The answer to the inquiry is complex, for there are two parts. The popularity, popularity of Professor Tolkien's fantasy books did encourage me to develop my own. But while there are bits and pieces of his works reflected hazily in mine, I believe that his influence as a whole is quite minimal. Okay, so you should be able to infer meaning from the opening paragraph of any article, uh, because the opening paragraph of any article or paper should include your basic journalistic principles of who, what, when, where, why, and how. So I'm not going to read the entire thing. Um, but basically what Gygax is saying in this article is that while Tolkien had an influence, it, it's not the essence of D&D. &D. And I, I get that. Um, I mean, there are certain corollaries between, you know, popular fantasy fiction and... Um, and Dungeons and Dragons because it's fantasy. That's that's it, you know. And I think there was a time where I thought that like D and D just ripped off Tolkien because there were so many elements. But I really, you know, as I've gotten older, I realize that there's so much more than that. And and Gygax even says here in the article, a careful examination of the games will quick quickly reveal that the major influences are Robert E. Howard, L. Sprague de Camp and Fletcher Pratt, Fritz Lieber, um, Paul Anderson, A. Merritt, and H.P. Lovecraft. Only slightly lesser influence came from Rogers Lasney, E.R. Burroughs, Michael Moorcock, Philip, you know. So, in other words, um, Tolkien was an influence, but so were all of these other authors. And and I agree. Like, as somebody who grew up playing d and I read a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm You know, I'm a big Tolkien fan, but I'm also... A big Conan fan probably bigger like I read way more Conan comic books than I did um, Tolkien stuff um, and Lovecraft big Lovecraft fan too so I, I think a lot of the elements of fantasy and even some of the horror fantasy stuff um, were incorporated in tabletop role-playing games so this is simply an article where Gygax uh, excuses himself from plagiarism, in my opinion. He's basically just saying, I did not rip off Tolkien. D&D is much more than that. Yes, Tolkien might have been an influence to me when I was younger, but it's not just a ripoff. Now, part of that stems from the fact that I think there was actual accusations from the Tolkien estate, which is why um, in D&D halflings are called halflings and not called hobbits even though effectively they are hobbits uh, and he even mentions here on the second page of this article um, orcs and ents um, you know so there, there there were some things there that you know in D, D people clearly drew parallels to so he says hobbit is another folk word borrowed from legends but tolkien personified and developed these diminutive stalwarts extensively they and the name are virtually unique to his works and the halflings of both game systems draw substantial inspiration from them okay so you know so basically i think this article acknowledges the influence but also excuses uh, gygax and tsr from plagiarizing you know and, and provides a rationale for how that works um, they have the World Gamer's Guide. Very interesting. Um, list of game stores. 
um, people who are doing games, conventions, convention calendar. You know, again, kind of hearkening to the fact that Dragon Magazine was, you know, in the in the pre-internet era, um, it was a cool way for people to get together. Okay, interesting thing. Check this out. This is a ad. Okay. In the time of the Satanic Panic, remember that you know there was a period in the '80s where. Uh, the media firestorm lit up around Dungeons and Dragons, and you know there was all these accusations that it was, you know, spurring uh, violence and suicide and Satanism and other occult activities, right? So out of that era is born this, this this ad: Christians! Exclamation point. Learn how to fight at the gates of hell. Do you have the courage to fight evil? The overlord of many names calls you to obedience to stand firm and fight as a warrior in full armor, unflinching and brave as a stalwart light raider, ready to war against the dark creatures and rescue the dragon slaves from the dreaded dragons. Here's the challenge for all light raiders to rise up and do battle, a confrontation that deals with the real world in a role-playing fantasy setting. Sharpen your wits, take on extra power with word rune wisdom and Give a victory for the Overlord as you join your fellow Light Raiders in battle. I never played this game, nor did I try it, but I, I probably laughed at it at that age. I think this is a direct response. Um, and it's, it's, it's the tabletop role-playing game equivalent of Christian rock, in my opinion. Right? So... You know, rock and roll and heavy metal went through this whole period where people were associating it with devil worship and Satanism and all these bad things and suicide and, you know, just like D&D. Um, and then out of that comes, you know, some, some response. I don't know who made this game. I don't know how good it was. I don't know if anybody played it. But, you know, this seems to me to be a response to the times, as it were. Um, let's create a game that is Christian and promotes good. It's basically like lawful good D&D, okay, uh, with another name slapped on it. How Taxes Take Their Toll. The King's Collectors Don't Have It Easy Either by Arthur Collins. So, um, Dragon Magazine interviewing... Algoris Stanhorst, Chancellor of the Exchequer, serving as Royal Majesty Sinifer Bretwalda Feldren. Um, so this is a in-character interview between Dragon Magazine and a fictional character um, talking about collecting taxes. Kind of an interesting concept, but I'm not going to read it all right now. Um, this is definitely something as a kid I would have skipped over. But as an adult, I think it's kind of interesting because what it does is it reveals in character how um, NPCs in your world could function. And you, I, could, I could stretch this into a game concept, right? Um, you know, may, wh whether it's kind of the Robin Hood concept of, you know, some form of tyranny who's overtaxing the people that needs to be fought or you know maybe the, the taxes are legitimate and just and there's some criminal organization who's preventing the proper taxing bodies from doing their jobs who knows um, anyway take that for what it is it's a couple pages of article then we have the ecology of the cockatrice so uh, this was a series where the ecology of where basically they would take one creature or monster per issue and expand it. Now, if you play D&D 5e, you'll know that this is um, basically the mode for all the current hardcovers that expand on monsters as well. So like Volo's Guide to Monsters kind of does the same thing. It, it takes existing monsters and expands on them. Okay, Why do that? Because... You know, if you look at a monster in the original monster manual, you maybe had like a picture, a block of stats, and then like a one or two paragraph description. It didn't give you a lot about how to integrate that monster into your game. So what the venerable master Ed Greenwood did was give you 
examples. So basically he expanded on the creature or monster and then gave you examples about how to use it in, a, in almost like a module sort of way. Um, and again, this is done in character, okay? So, um, I don't think I've ever used a cockatrice in a game, but this makes me think that I could. Um, here, I'm gonna skip to this part. The cockatrice is an unintelligent, nasty, avaricious creature about the size of a large goose or turkey that often flies into a fit of rage. The creature is infamous, for the permanent flesh to stone power of its touch, but man is not its deliberate prey. Its habitat and habits its habitat and habits are little known and much confused by myth and old wives' tales. What follows is, however, known to be true as far as it goes. Males are more numerous than females, which lack the wattles and have much smaller homes, and the latter are very seldom without a mate, or several mates, who will fight constantly among themselves over the female. Cockatrices are immune to their own and fellow cockatrices' petrification powers and spend much time strutting, fighting among themselves, or foraging. A male and female pair, or the more unusual grouping of one strong female with several consort males, will mate often and noisily, screeching and cackling all the while. The female will lay a clutch of one to two eggs a month at the waxing of the moon, which she guards watchfully while the male hunts food for her. The eggs are brownish red, flecked with rust, rust red speckles, and they have hard, brittle shells. An egg that is fertile will hatch in 11 to 19 days. An immature cockatrice is small, roughly fist sized, but otherwise identical in appearance to its parents. Cockatrices are vain, bullying creatures, and amongst themselves there is a constant battle for status. So it's funny because, you know, to, to the um, unsuspecting adventurers, this could seem to be just a simple chicken encounter, right? Kick the chicken, move on. And then, you know, I, I think it's pretty crazy, though, when you think about it, that, like, a stupid chicken could petrify you. But, you know, those are the hazards of playing in D&D. Uh, it is important to note that the cockatrice can choose not to petrify by its touch. If it could not, it would never be able to eat. But this is a conscious, deliberate act of will on its part, and at other times its touch automatically petrifies. Be aware, however, that the flesh to stone power of the cockatrice is just that. Its touch only affects the actual flesh or body of a creature and does not work through or upon clothing, armor, or other inanimate objects. Thus, someone covered in head-to-toe armor has little to worry about, but someone with any sizable patch of flesh showing is in danger. For the cockatrice knows instinctively where to strike to bring about the stoning effect and will aim for the vulnerable spot. So, there you go. There's some, there's some context for the DM who might want to use the cockatrice um, and some expansion on the, I guess, the, the culture of the animals, uh, how they work, why they do what they do. Um, so, just kind of interesting. All right, here is another uh, great advertisement for Twilight 2000, which was a game that came out and was super crunchy and super... I just remember this at the time being like the most realistic military post-apocalyptic game that had ever come out. Um, and they even say the real trick in game design is to produce detailed, accurate effects with simple systems. That's what we did in Twilight 2000. Uh, I remember fondly playing this a few times with my brother uh, who went deep into planning this stuff and it was awesome. And I actually still have my box set with the expansions. So maybe in a future from the vault, we'll go deep into exploring Twilight 2000. Um, if you were one of the people who played this game, comment below, share your thoughts about uh, and your experiences. Okay, so here we go. Dragonlance Chronicles Volume 1, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. Uh, Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman. Here's an advertisement for Armory Dice, world's largest selection, um, with lots of hobby stores listed carrying their dice. All right, prices for the Roaring Twenties, a way to measure PC's purchasing power by Glenn Raman. Okay, the early 20th century is the setting for more than one popular fantasy role-playing game. The 1920s is also 
uh, is the prescribed time period in Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu game. While many scenarios of TSR's Gangbusters, Fantasy Games Unlimited Gangster, and Flying Buffalo's Mercenaries, Spies and Private Eyes can be set within that decade. So, right off the bat, here's a big difference. Dragon Magazine in this era was not just TSR. They covered the gaming industry. So here's an article that would have benefited anyone playing any of those games. And uh, I did play Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu. And having uh, like a, an expanded price list like this would have been a great asset. Um, I remember when I was developing um, Call of Cthulhu Adventures, like interviewing my dad, who was born in 1923, about what life was like in Chicago uh, in the, the late 20s and the 30s so that I could have a more realistic sense of, of how to run my game and, and what, you know, what players should do and what they could expect. So something very reasonable like this um, and helpful would have been a tremendous asset in that sense. So we have uh, categories including women's clothing and accessories, men's clothing and accessories, office study laboratory, the kitchen, the home, hardware, miscellaneous. So this is, I mean, this is fantastic. This just by itself would have been uh, uh, something that we would have photocopied and kept at the table for any game. Um, and I might even have photocopies of this. I don't, I don't remember, but yeah, so that's, that's another valuable component of Dragon Magazine. All right, here we are. Credit where credit is due. Elaborating upon the experience point rules by Catherine Kerr. So I bet you that if I was reading this when I was 12 or 13, I would have skipped this article. But now I think it's so relevant, especially as people talk about different ways to reward experience. When I was a kid, there's a reason why everything was a hack and slash, because we tracked literally every kill. Every time we killed something, the DM would tell us how much experience, and we tracked it on a separate sheet. And at the end of the adventure, we'd tally it up. And we were particular about it because, you know, at that age when you're a tween, you, cheating was a thing. So we'd check each other. Like, you'd have to have somebody sign off on your sheet to prove that you didn't, like, add things up. And we started labeling, you know, by encounter how many kills we had. And people had to, like, initial it. So we were particular about that. Now I'm older, and I don't do anything like that. Now I kind of go with more of the milestone stuff where, you know, we play, and then I tell you when you level based on what we've done. Uh, it makes things a lot simpler. But the other thing is, is it de-emphasized the value of just killing things for experience. So here's an article from 85. In a time period when most people would have been playing D&D from a, a kind of tactical, crunchy perspective, right? And role-playing, R-O-L-E, playing your character in their role, would not have garnered as much experience value. Things like skill checks, successfully using your skills, would not have garnered much experience value because there weren't really skills and feats in this edition. So, before we delve into this article, I wanted to give you that context for, for my sense of what this article should be. Um, and it should be kind of a prophetic and insightful look at the game at this time and how it could be better. Okay, the good old hack and slash campaign, anyone who plays the AD&D game knows all about it. The main activity is killing monsters, preferably by the dozens, and looting their worldly goods. Whether action is set in a dungeon or above ground, what counts to the players and the dungeon master alike is the body count at the end of the session. The more dead orcs, dragons, and demons, the better. Because killing the same old thing stops being fun after a while, this kind of game produces some of the most unbelievable and biologically impossible monsters that never walked the earth. Ah. I like that Catherine Kerr, in this first paragraph has pointed out the existing status quo of how the game is played by most people, and then slightly, delicately posits that this is getting boring after a while, right? This is long before the term murder hobo came up. But remember that at this time in D&D, &D, 
you got experience for killing things and you got experience for treasure. So think about how the system encouraged what would become the murder hobo. Kill treasure, right? So if you take that element out and you make it a, more about the narrative, more about the story, I can't emphasize that enough. I do it in every video that I do. Um, you make your game different. Let's read on. An endless string of search and destroy missions produces a particular kind of player, one whose main motivation is sheer greed. Although in theory his paladin is devoted to the true, the good, and the beautiful, and her magic user wants arcane knowledge for its own sake, show them enough treasure and they loot and kill like half-starved mercenaries. Eventually this kind of player presents the DM with a genuine problem, the extremely powerful character who can blast or bash everything in sight and sees no reason to refrain from doing so. After all, heaps of dead monsters and treasure translate directly into a vast amount of experience points. In the right circumstances, it doesn't take long for players to build up characters who could take artifacts away from the gods as easily as they would lift a drunken sailor's purse. Okay, so, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you people, for this episode, I did not read this article first. I read the header. So, my predictions about what this article will address are spot on. And 12-year-old me wouldn't have cared about this article because 12-year-old me was too busy counting kills and racking up uh, treasure so that I could level. But, you know, 40s me says, well, the game gets really boring if all you do is kill and loot. So you've got to have narrative. You've got to have story. Um, and actually, it didn't take me until now to realize that. I realized that in the early 90s. And part of that was exploring other game systems that were more narrative uh, in their drive, including White Wolf games like uh, Vampire and Mage, where killing stuff didn't get you anything. Um, it was all about the story. So you can translate that same concept into your D&D games. But let's, let's take a, a couple more looks at this. Um, after all, experience points are the real goal of players and characters, even more than treasure or mayhem. All players want their characters to amass as many points as possible. In the AD&D game rules, there are only two ways of gaining these coveted experience points, slaying and looting. And she provides her references there. With these limits, it's no wonder that players want as many chances for their characters to kill and loot as possible. Let's look at an example. I'm skipping ahead, by the way. Let's look at an example of a scenario that provides plenty of game action but gives the DM no opportunity to assign experience points under the rules. An NPC who is well-known and well-liked by the PC party is kidnapped and sold into slavery in a distant city. The party members decide to rescue him, but upon arriving at the city, they discover that their friend's owner refuses to sell him back. Attempting violence in the well-guarded city would mean their arrest. The PCs, however, are given the chance to make the owner sell their friend back to them by using guile if they either gather enough information to blackmail the owner, seduce his daughter, or both. In this scenario, not only does using violence mean failure, but the PCs are going to have to pay out gold, not gain any, to rescue their friend. How then is the DM going to reward the party members if they, successful, if they successfully think their way through the problem? There we have it, in a nutshell. So um, the article continues to go on talking about what experience points are and how they work. And what mature me loves about this article is that it is a affirmation of what I've thought all along, that you have to expand your game. It's got to be more about killing and looting. Uh, killing and looting is what le led to power gaming, and it's what ultimately leads to power creep. When you add different narrative elements, or sometimes when you take things away and you focus on the story more, it, it creates a whole new experience for you and your players. Um, new goals need new awards. As we've seen, the current experience point rules in the AD&D game are limited because they were designed to judge a scenario with goals that almost invariably involve killing monsters and gaining treasure. To expand beyond a hack and slash campaign, the DM needs to emphasize new kinds of action such as wilderness exploration, political intrigue, and play in cities. Yeah, I love all those things. So she goes on then for another three full pages um, talking about nonviolent situations. So these are all story hooks. 
This article is gold. This is gold. It's modern day gold. I'm going to close this article, though. I'm, I have to skip this just out of time. But I'm going to close it with um, some rules of thumb. So she basically sums up some ideas here that you can incorporate even today. Number one, make sure that the material for the adventure is indeed one single scenario. Two, define the major goal of the scenario. Three, determine the opposition to the goal. Four, personify the opposition, if necessary, as a single monster. And monster is in quotes, so it could be just a person, an NPC. Five, use the table in the DMG to determine the actual point award for the personified opposition. Six, determine bonuses. Seven, keep in mind the measure of challenge rule in the DMG. Some of those things don't apply to fifth edition, but they kind of do. I mean, if you think of challenge rating, um, when all else is said and done, remember that creativity is the key to enjoyable gaming. Since the system for awarding experience points outlined here is designed for creative and unusual scenarios, the DMs who use it will have to be creative themselves and adapt it to their own needs. In closing, I strongly urge DMs to remember the abstract nature of the D&D game's experience point system. They should stay firmly within it by awarding points only for major goals that require the use of many PC skills to achieve. Although it's tempting to give point awards for specific actions, such awards really do run counter to the spirit of the game. While creativity is the most important thing a DM needs for good gaming, a sound and consistent system of rules runs a close second. Boom. There we have it, people. Um, that, that is just a prophetic article. Prophetic. Okay. The Many Shapes of Apes. Giving Primates the Attention They Deserve by Stephen Innes, okay? So here we go. Instead of just a single stat block and a description, they go into more detail about apes, which you can incorporate into your game uh, and how to incorporate them and more descriptions. So again, you know, if you think about Dragon Magazine at the time, this $3 magazine had so much to offer in terms of content and material. Um, that it's hard to find a parallel nowadays other than, you know, community sourced stuff. But at the time, the company provided all these things, you know, and now we have the digital equipment uh, equivalent, I guess, would be Dragon Plus. But that really just focuses on Wizards of the Coast and not so much um, beyond that. Whereas this, this era was really embracing the whole of the gaming community. Okay, so here we go. Some more ads for some games. Ah, Into the Forgotten Realms. Okay, so here we go, people. When we talk about, um, when we talk about Dragon Magazine being a resource, here's basically like a free module. Into the Forgotten Realms, a tournament adventure for the AD&D game designed by Ed Greenwood. So you got a, a freebie here. Uh, Into the Forgotten Realms is a tournament module for the ad and game, which was used at Gen Con 17 in August of 1984, designed to be played through by 10 players. Jesus. A time limit of four hours is placed on completing the adventure for scoring purposes. The accent in this module is on role-playing and creative problem-solving. I find that interesting. You have 10 players and four hours to do a dungeon crawl, and you're saying that this is going to emphasize role-playing? Maybe problem-solving, but role-playing? Uh, okay. I would love if, if there's anybody watching this who is at Gen Con 17 and played through this to let me know how much actual role-playing was done. I'd love to hear about that story. I kind of feel like... You, that's a paradox. Like, how do you, how do you have a, a four-hour, ten-player game with? I'm just looking at the map with 27 areas that you have to discover. 30 areas that you have to discover, explore. Yikes. Um, so they provide information about the player or for the players. The Dale Lands of the Forgotten Realms have been your homes, as well as your adventuring grounds, for many years. 
So this is kind of cool in a sense because it it uh, it brings up the Forgotten Realms before the Forgotten Realms were published as a big thing in D and D. Um, so again, you know, from a, just a geeking out perspective, this is pretty cool. It's like seeing the you know sneak peeking um, the Forgotten Realms. Then it has Dungeon Master's information. The School of Wizardry, broken down by area, just like in a module. Uh, it gives player character sheets. So here's, permission is granted to photocopy these pages. <laughs> you know what would be fun is if I ran this. How fun would that be? If I ran this game, I don't even know if I could run it in first edition AD&D. I don't know if I remember the rules well enough. But how fun would it be to run this game and have people actually play all these characters and see what you could do? Or just to, to kitbash it and run it in 5th edition. That would be interesting. So yeah, basically it's a, whole, it's a whole Gen Con module summed up in a few pages. Um, well done, Ed Greenwood. Maybe that's something I'll have to think about. Now at the bottom of the last page it says Into the Forgotten Realms scoring system. So the player judged to be the best role player in the group by the DM earns 25 points with 15 points going to second best and 10 going to third. In addition, points are awarded to players and characters for accomplishing the following things. So there's specific benchmarks in the module that they had to achieve. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll run this with 10 people and four hours and see how it goes. Maybe. All right, now we have on page 55, battles above the dungeon, basic combat tactics for wide open spaces. So in the illustration, they have a flying steed. Um, pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, issues 87 and 88 carried an excellent two-part article by Catherine Kerr about outdoor adventuring. So I guess this is just another way to expand the options for DMs to think about outdoor adventuring, mobility, firepower. Um, Spellcasters should not overlook the value of talking to the native wildlife. You know, so here's this picture of presumably a druid or a ranger talking to a little owl. Um, but this is a pretty big art article um, talking about outdoor adventures, which now just seems sort of a given. You know, if you have the 5th edition DM's guide, they kind of have whole sections about that. But, you know, you got to remember, people, that at this time in D&D &D history, we were talking about primarily dungeon crawls. People were, were doing big dungeon crawls. That was kind of, that was it. You know, that was the, the end-all, be-all. Uh, whether it was specifically a dungeon or whether it was caves or ruins, it kind of came down to dungeon crawls. So just open sandbox style gaming wasn't really that common. And this is just kind of encouraging different ways to set your game. All good stuff. Okay, so here we have a short um, story, Desperate Acts by Gordon Linsner. Not going to read it to you, but this was just another thing that they included in this era of Dragon Magazine. They had um, short fiction that was typically, you know, related to fantasy. Sometimes it was sci-fi, but, you know, one way or the other, it kind of worked. So this one's, uh, what, eight pages? All right, then they have Coming Attractions, Conan Role-Playing Game, Seventh Seal for Top Secret, uh, Project Wide Awake for Marvel Superheroes. Um, battle system, AD&D modules. Yeah, so a lot of good stuff there. All right, then we have the Ares science fiction gaming section. So this was an acknowledgement of the growth of the science fiction gaming genre, but it was also TSR's way to kind of sneak in through the back door some of their new games. One of those was Star Frontiers, which I was enamored with. Now, I was not a big Star Trek fan, fan Star Trek fan, fan. Um, I was big into Star Wars, of course, because who wasn't? But, you know, I mean, I knew about Star Trek, but the idea was that Star Frontiers kind of combined all these cool things that I loved about 
movies and shows like Star Wars and Star Trek and like Battlestar Galactica, kind of all that sci-fi space future stuff. And it was a fun game to play. And we really took it as a group, and, and especially thanks to my brother, we went beyond just what they released. We created our own worlds, and we had real complex storylines that we, you know, space opera kind of level stuff. So, um, but it was a great game, great fun game to play. Um, and really, it's funny because now, so far removed, a lot of people, unless you're like my age, they don't know about Star Frontiers because it really never... It, it never uh, existed beyond TSR. Whereas other, you know, TSR gaming products, um, Top Secret, for example, the spy and espionage game, that's back. You know, Gamma World has had multiple iterations. Um, D&D, obviously. Um, Marvel Super Heroes. You know, a lot of the, the games that TSR put out had new incarnations or rebirths under different brands. Uh, but Star Frontiers never really did, which is a shame. But, I mean, there, there are plenty of sci-fi, futuristic space gaming options to play out there. But Star, Star Frontiers was a lot of fun. So, uh, so this, this was an article about uh, alien starships for the Star Frontiers Nighthawks battles. So Nighthawks was basically more of the ship-based thing, less focused on your character and more focused on ship-to-ship -ship combat. Um, which we did a little bit of, but it was it was fun. Uh, so they give you some Zuricor ship statistics. And then we have now even the ads. It's funny because even the ads here, most of them are fantasy, but Psy World is an ad that I saw frequently from Fantasy Games Unlimited. Um, all right, star questions, answers, and advice on the Gamma World game. So here's here's a little bit more. Um, and this was, I think, the second edition of Gamma World when this was put out, which used um, the Matrix system. Uh, it's like a color-coded kind of Matrix system. I'll show when when I someday in my From the Vault stuff, I'll show you Gamma World second edition. Um, but there were a bunch of TSR games that used it. So Star Frontiers used it. Uh, Marvel Super Heroes, the box set, used it. Gamma World used it. Um, I don't think D&D ever used that system, but it was kind of like a color-coded percentile dice, and then, you know, where, where your percentile dice rolled on this matrix determined what color, and that color determined your success level. And there was all these other crunchy factors. But, um, yeah, the mini-missile does... 10d10 points of damage to everyone within its 30 meter blast radius as stated in the basic rules booklet the entry in the weapons chart is incorrect so a lot of these questions were clarifications um, about gamma world are radiated eyes given a weapon class or are they covered in physical attack matrix too Radiation eyes are not weapons and therefore do not have to score hits as physical attacks. The radiation beam will affect any creature within range that is directly in the line of sight when the attack goes off. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. Moving on. Anti-missiles and round shot. Variant ship-to-ship -ship weapons for Traveler gaming. I never played Traveler. I know it was a popular sci-fi game. All right, over here we have the Marvel file, Pumping Iron, Part 1. Um, Iron Man descriptions. So, Marvel superheroes providing here. Here they are providing some more stats for the different Iron Man people. Um, Tony Stark, Rhodes, Iron Man armor. There's the Marvel superheroes game. Um. A new race for the Ringworld game, the Dolphins of Known Space. I never played Ringworld. No idea what that's about. But, you know, here again, showing diversity in their gaming coverage in Dragon Magazine with a multi-page layout here that covers this species and different things about them for that game. Uh, right, and now we're towards the end 
Uh, got an ad here for Villains and Vigilantes, another game that I never played. Uh, Ral Partha, Fantasy Forge. These are all miniatures. Uh, these would have been, I think, pewter by this time. They, they were metal. They weren't lead anymore because people figured out that lead minis were dangerous. I have some lead minis still. Um, then we got the Gamer's Guide. This is kind of the cheap advertising section. I, I used to like to look through this. Sometimes I wonder if, like, I went online right now and, you know, searched these things, see if any of these were still open. It'd be pretty epic if they were. Um, then we've got an ad for Gen Con 18, In Search of Adventure, Mark Your Calendar, Plan Now to Attend, Game Convention, August 22nd through 25th, 1985 at Mecca, the Milwaukee Exposition and Convention Center. So it went from Lake Geneva to Milwaukee, and now it's in Indianapolis. All right, then one of my favorite comics, Wormy. And then um, that's actually a multi-page Wormy right there. And then Dragon Mirth, pardon me, but are you basic set or advanced? That's kind of funny. Um, I, like, I like that illustration. And then there's two dragons talking down here. If you're going to eat these things, you have to peel them first. See, it's like a, a guy with armor. Uh, here's a poem. A dour old dwarf named Fritz was burned right here, right where he sits. That happens, they say, when you get in the way of a dragon just as he spits. By Tony Lee Perry. Nice job few more comics here and then we get to snarf quest by larry elmore love snarf quest love the story and the characters reminded me so much of the black and white conan the barbarian and savage sword of conan comics loved it loved it loved it uh, kind of a combination of the comedy and the fantasy great times great times so um that brings us to the last full page color advertisement for Paranoia, which is a game I did play, a lot of fun. And then Middle Earth um, role playing, Iron Crown Enterprises Middle Earth role playing. So um, that's it for this edition of From the Vault, Dragon Magazine, issue number 95. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, as always, for commenting, sharing your thoughts on this old nostalgic run through nerd history. See you on the next one. How's my mustache look? Hey, thanks for watching that video. Make sure that you subscribe and click on that little notifications bell to make sure you don't miss any of the videos. While you're at it, check out some of the other amazing content here on the channel. Find me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, reach out and become a connection on LinkedIn. And <laughs> uh, I can't do it, LinkedIn. I can't do it.